In the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 8, I just want to read a verse of Scripture here beginning. Paul writing to the Corinthians as concerning the churches of Macedonia. He said, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wither the grace of God. Begin with verse 1. Eighth chapter, bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power, I bear a record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing uh, of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. In Exodus chapter 29, I want to read in that chapter, verse 41, verse 41, uh, beginning in the 29th chapter, beginning with verse 41. This is the chapter where we describe to us the evening and the morning sacrifice. We have in Exodus the morning sacrifice. The man of God by the Holy Ghost said was for a sin offering. The evening sacrifice, he described it to us as being the burnt offering. That gives you exactly the meaning of these sacrifices. What we're reading now is about the evening sacrifice, which is the burnt offering. And the other lamb thou shalt offer it even, and shalt do thereto according to the meat offering of the morning, according to the drink offering thereof, for a sweet savor, and an offering made by fire unto the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Where, listen to it, I will meet you, number one, to speak with there unto you, number two, and I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. And I'll sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. And I will sanctify also both Aaron and his son to minister, and, uh, to minister me in the priest's office. In the second Psalms, in verse 8, God talking to Christ, and he says to him, Ask of me, and I'll give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. Ask of me, God said to Jesus, and ultimately to the church, and I will give you the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth, for thine inheritance. In Matthew 9.38, our Lord exhorted the church to pray about one particular burden of his heart, and that is pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into that harvest. In John 4.35, he told us of the urgency of that. He said, don't say there's four months, and then there's coming a harvest. For I say to you that the fields are ripe for the harvest right now, he's saying to us. Then in Romans 10, you have in verses 10 through 13 this message he talks about a people that have to hear, a people that do not know God. And he says, how can they hear without a preacher? And how can it preach? except to be sent. There you have the burden of the Lord Jesus set forth here to the church in, in very graphic language. But to the fulfillment of that, there has to be conditions met on this side. And I believe it's discovered here in this message of the evening sacrifice. The morning sacrifice... He said it was a sin offering. Christ gave himself for our sin. That won't ever happen again. He will not die again. He came once in the end of this world and gave himself 
for us, our sins, all of us. Christ came. Now the evening sacrifice, he said, was a burnt offering. Now if there's to be an increase of Christ, something about us has to become that burnt offering. Cannot be otherwise. I must decrease if Christ is to increase. And all that God is interested in, and all that interests God is Christ. And it is to this end that He works to conform us from birth uh, by the Spirit to the baptism and a walk in the Holy Spirit. It is the will and the purpose of God to conform us to the image of Christ. Now this evening sacrifice is us, this saint, offered himself, and according to Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, this is the evening sacrifice. It is here, God is saying, that you come to me with everything on that altar. There cannot be other. When it came time to offer that evening sacrifice, you find in the book of Kings, Elisha, he repaired the altar, slayed the bullock, cut him up and put him on that altar. And the reason he cut him up was to make him fit that altar. Nothing was to be hanging off. Every part of that bullock, every part of that sacrifice must be on that altar. This God is saying to us, in that evening sacrifice, we don't offer lambs, we don't offer bullets, we offer ourselves unto God. He said the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. It is there on that altar that we're to offer ourselves. This is a condition of the fire. The fire never falls on an empty altar, and it never comes where that altar, where a person is half on and half off. That bullock all must, we must all be on that altar. It never falls, the fire never falls on an empty altar. God never moves. Now, every time in history where this sacrifice has been offered, it has been followed by a mighty moving of God. Wherever people offered themselves to God after Calvary so that God could flow through them, Wherever this has happened, there's been a revival. We can beat on that altar, we can cry, but until we're willing to give ourselves to the cause for which we pray, then revival's not going to come. Now I feel here on this Christmas Eve, it is a time that we celebrate the birth of Christ and the greatest gift ever given to humanity, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now He's saying to us, I have given all. Can you give any less? And this is what the evening sacrifice was all about. Wherever men offered this, when the apostles offered those early, when they climbed the steps of that upper room, they were dead, mister. Everything is gone. They had put everything down for Christ. Look at them as they climbed those steps. They have laid everything. The fishing nets have rotted. The boats have been stolen. The doctor's office is closed, and the clients and patients have found another doctor. The, the, the tax collector is out. There is no more. Nothing. They climb those steps, and the same people in the streets are waiting to crucify them that crucified their Lord. I'm telling you, when they climbed the steps of that upper room, they were dead folks on a furlough. Everything else, the only thing that mattered was Christ. The message to tarry was given to above 500 brethren. 380 plus of them counted the cost and said it wasn't worth it because your life had to be on the line. They knew, and the prophecy of Jesus to them was, if they've done it unto a green, what will they do unto a dry? If they're doing it to me, don't weep over me, he said. Weep over yourself. This same crowd that is crucifying me will do worse to you. And to climb those steps and to offer that sacrifice of themselves to God brought the greatest revival of history.
Into that upper room flowed Pentecost. This was the answer to the evening sacrifice. When Luther offered that sacrifice in the face of a world that threatened to burn him to a stake, when they called him to the diet of worms, they begged him not to go. They said to him, you'll never return. They'll burn you like the rest of them. But he said, I'm not only willing to die, uh, to, but whatever, he said, if they build the fire from Wittenberg to Rome, Luther said, I march in it shouting the praises of him that has revealed such a truth. Luther offered himself. He was that sacrifice, and the revival fell. It's been that way in history. If God could find a people that would give themselves totally, absolutely, no reservations to the cause of Jesus Christ, it will happen. God's promises of that sacrifice are three. I rest this to bring out that it's a time that we give ourselves. He, three things God said to him as concerning that burnt offering. I read it in your hearing. He said it will be offered at the door of the tabernacle. It will be offered right there in that outer court of things. You will offer this sacrifice. And he said three things God said when you offer this, when you offer yourself unreservedly, when you allow God, to deal with every facet of your life, and all is placed upon that altar of God, then God says to you, three things I'll do. Number one, I will meet you there. You will not come and place yourself on that altar without my meeting you there. I will meet you there. What could you ever ask anymore? This is the grounds of God's coming to us, ladies and gentlemen. He doesn't come to the half-hearted. He doesn't come to the carnal. He doesn't come to those of Ananias and Sapphira that says, I'm going to invest a little bit into it to find out whether it's going to work or not. It is to those that come to that altar and everything is placed there. All I am and ever hope to be are here on this altar. The preaching of the Word of God is to be designed to bring the worshiper to fit that altar because it's only there can we be conformed to the image of Christ. Only there as we're conformed to that altar in the book of Revelation, when the angel came to measure, he said, you measure the temple, measure the altar, and measure the worshiper. Why should you measure the worshiper? Because that worshiper must fit that altar. As you measured by the Word of God, if that murmuring, backbiting is still there, it must be cut off. You can leave nothing hanging off of that altar. All must be touched. Every emotion, every attitude, every thought of the human heart must be touched by the fire of God. You cannot, that covetous spirit that would keep you from supporting a gospel, the only hope of mankind must be on that altar. That fire will not fall as long as you are, have reservations but it is here God said, if you give all, if you put it all on that altar, number one, I'll meet you there. Number two, he said, I'll speak to you there. Oh, God, what a, what a message. My God, he said, I'll talk to you there. You've been trying to get him to say something to you. Well, he's not going to say anything to you in a half backslidden condition. He isn't going to say anything to you unless you're willing to lay it all out. But he said, if you will, I'll meet you there and I'll speak to you. You know what that's saying? I'll instruct you there. I'll tell you there. You want to know the will of God? You want to know the direction of God? Then present yourself to God in such a way God can talk to you. He doesn't come to the carnal. He didn't come to the indifferent. He comes to that when it's all there. Whatever it takes for my will to break, that I must be willing to do. He says to you and I, I'll meet you there. Number one, 
I'll speak to you there, number two, and I'll cleanse the temple there, number three. If I come to you, when you leave that altar, it'll all be right. I'll cleanse you. Whatever you've laid on that altar, I will destroy. I will take up. I will put the fire to. I will put the torch to. If you're willing to give it up, I'll burn it up. That's what God is saying. If you lay it there, I'll do the rest of it. Dear God, He's telling us, church, we can come here, pound around on this altar, we can act like God's asleep, and we've got to wake Him up if we want to, but God is saying to us, if you'll come and you'll present yourself to me, if you'll be willing for what I'm, you're asking me to do to come through you, I'll meet you there. And when I meet you, I'll talk to you, I'll sanctify you. Now this is the meaning of Psalms 2 and 8 when he said of Jesus, and you must know that what he did, the sacrifice he made, he made as a man, not God. He came, walked this earth as a man, as a man full of the Holy Spirit. And God said to him on those grounds, Ask of me, and I'll give you the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for your possession." Now, the meaning of that asking is that everything else has to be dead. There can't be any other desires when you come to this. There can't be any reservations. If we're going to ask Him for those heathen, then there must not be anything withheld that would reach that from your own life to whatever you have. Some go, some sin, all pray, all travail, all labor. The uttermost parts of the earth is next door to you. You have to talk to them. God isn't going to send anybody along to talk to them. If you know me, sent you there. That's the reason you live in that neighborhood. That's the reason you work on that job. That's the reason you go to that school. That's the reason you're, you're there. It's because God put you there to go in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Ask, ask. When he said to him, ask of me, and I'll give you the heathen. Jesus knew that to ask meant he had to go to Calvary. It meant he had to die. Amen. There can't be any other ambition, no other desire. There can't be any other thinking. If you want that heathen, you must be possessed by God, and you must feel for that world like God felt for it. He fell for it to give His Son. And the Son fell for it enough to die, to accept that. Ask of me, God said, and I'll give you the heathen. It meant a total, absolute sacrifice of Himself. Now, following that, there comes this. When a man has made that commitment to God, when that commitment is made and everything is on that altar, then there comes, I will give. Ask of me. That is, I come. I, when you come for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, He said He'd give the Holy Ghost to them that ask Him. Now that ask means that you're willing to die to every other. God didn't come in you to share His life uh, with your life. You must be willing to give up your own life and let Him. His life be lived through you. He hadn't given it for the flesh to have a good time. He's given the Holy Spirit to make Jesus real. Everything else the same. When we begin to ask for the heathen, God said, ask of me. Let us be willing to die to all else. And I will give. Thank God. I will give. That is a promise of God. If I give myself God is saying, I will give. I will give. Now, how can we? Now, when we ask, though we must be prepared to move, I ask God Almighty to supply the need of this church financially. Then I must be willing for as much of those finances as possible to come through me. When I ask God for revival, I must be willing for that revival to come through me. When I ask God for the heathen, I must be willing to go if He calls me to go. Or I must be willing to give that those that are called can go. There is nobody exempt. Nobody is exempt. But that all is on that altar. That presents no problem. If I've died, 
then that job, houses, land, everything becomes secondary. When everything is on that altar, he said, if you love anything more than you love me, that is your God. If you love houses, lands, wives, children, anything more than me, then you're not worthy of me because that's your God. You have something before me. That won't work. That don't mean you love your family less. You love them more, but you love God supremely. And when everything's on that altar where God is everything, I said, where God is everything, then God said, I will give. Amen. God will give to that person. There will come. We ask for that heathen. We then we must be willing to go. There can no longer uh, say, I wait till I retired. Retired nothing. They perish 120,000. Go to hell every day across this earth. There's no time to wait. I'll wait till I get a little more money. Wait nothing. It's now that they're lost and God is saying to us, we must now ask and not asking, give ourselves to this totally. How can we sit like Jonas in our little booths, carefree, contented, comfortable, while millions of modern men of us without Christ sink in to an endless, hopeless eternity? I tell you, I pray every morning that God will give this church a new vision of hell. That message that man preached, somebody give me, there ain't no place like hell. Let me tell you something. We somehow got to know there is no purgatory. There is no stop off. Men go to heaven or hell when they, do, when they leave this life. My God, let us see how awful it is. Let the church see what a terrible thing it is to be lost. I, I I wake up at night. I can hear that man as he preaches. There's no place like hell. He talked about he was in a cancer hospital and a man had had, had a cancer uh, of his head and it, it, had, it had gone so far. He didn't know everything. And he looked at him. They said he wasn't going to be here long. And they were talking about be merciful when he died. And, and he asked the man, did he know God? And he shook his head. And he said to him, there's not a man in hell, mister, that wouldn't trade places with you. No matter what's wrong with you. There isn't a man in hell. Men sitting on death row up there. Not a man in hell wouldn't trade with them. One more opportunity. The church must know that if we're going to weep over the lost. 3,000 million people on this planet never heard the name of Jesus. Yet God has charged us with the responsibility to tell them we are going to one day face God over the fact we never cared. It's not a matter that they won't be saved, can't be saved. It's a matter we refuse to give ourselves. Give ourselves. Listen, they, these millions... Sinking into a lost eternity. Not because it couldn't be saved, wouldn't be saved, it shouldn't be saved, but because the church really doesn't care. You listen to me? Because the church really doesn't care. Life has been so easy, we can just dismiss. I said we can dismiss from our minds. We can pray our little prayers without ever offering ourselves. There's principles in this Bible that cannot be violated. If God's going to talk to you, you're going to offer yourself. There's going to be an offering of yourself. They will believe if they hear the Great Commission, and God made us responsible that they hear. They will believe. There's folks just like you. They're no different from you. You believe there's millions of them will believe if they hear. But they can't hear without a preacher. We're debtors. Listen, if we believe if they hear, then we must preach it. We're debtors to the least, the last, the lost. My God, we owe it to everybody. This gospel, he says, you ask of me, I'll give them to you. But when I ask, then I must be willing for whatever it takes to do it to come through me. To the end, to the end, whatever it takes. I must be willing for that to happen. We are debtors. Christ is necessary for everybody or is not necessary for anybody. Now we have such foolishness being preached today that if you're a good Hindu, you'll make it. Whatever God you know, if you're good to that religion, I didn't so. There's one mediator between God and man, himself, man, Christ Jesus. A mediator means one equal to God that can intervene for us. There's nobody else 
but him. No other name. If he's not necessary for all, then he's not necessary for anybody. But if men are saved, they'll be saved because they met Christ. Now, here we have pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into his harvest. Paul said, how can they preach except they be sent? The word sent is twofold. To be set apart and to be sent out. Now, the to be set apart is a business of the Holy Spirit. God only can set a man apart. Only God can do such a miracle as to set a man apart. I can tell you, that's the responsibility of God. But to send out is the responsibility of the church. Amen. God isn't going to come down here and give an offering in our missionary offering. He give us that opportunity. Let me tell you something. He said, He said to, to pray that He will send forth labors. How can they preach except they be sent? God put His finger on a man. Call him to Africa, Asia, India, wherever. God put His finger on that man. Then God has set him apart for a ministry, but the church must send him out. And if it don't, men perish because he's not there. One of the first missionaries we ever had in this church, over behind in the old church, back in 19, maybe 60, a young man came, there weren't many of us, and the young man came, and he, he weeping in the office, said to me, Pastor, I've been in 70 missionary services. I'm no closer to getting to South America than I was when I started. I'm no closer there now. And I said, I'd like to talk to you about this money business. I said, you've been to the school of missions. They know how missionary works. I said, I know more about the money than they do. I said, I'm going to tell you, if you want to get down there, I'll tell you how. When you get to that pulpit tonight, and you look those folks in the eye, don't come trying to tell them all about South America. You've never been there either. They're not caring about the pantaloons they wear or the relics they make. What you've got to do is put in their heart that God has called you to South America and that people are being lost because you're not there and that the only reason you're not there is the church hasn't sent you. And I said, son, if you'll put that in that heart, if you'll touch that heart, men are being lost. They're going to hell every day because I haven't sent this man. I promise you they'll give. He got $2,500 that night as a powerful lot of money in 1960 out of that handful of people but he gripped that heart I'm not going to South America God set this man apart but it's a responsibility of the church to put him there let me tell you something folks God has people to go we must send them. It is a responsibility of the body. The church today, whether we realize it or not, is guilty. We dare not excuse ourselves any longer. It isn't a penny march. It isn't the leftovers of your life, folks. I believe time is running out. Europe is in a, in a foment. There's coming a revival of things over there that haven't been in hundreds of years. We're witnessing the stage set for Antichrist and the tribulation. The church must be about the master's business. There should be a rejoicing on the one hand because redemption draws nigh, but a burden on the other side because millions of people are lost that will listen if we will bring them the gospel, if we'll bring them the true gospel. They will be saved, folks. Church, I'm telling you, on this Christmas Eve, God gave His Son. He's not asking you to sacrifice in that direction, but God is saying to you, now you must give if Calvary's made real around this world. I went out that mall two or three times. Can't hardly get out of a store. Somebody reach over you, push you, shove you, trying to get the junk that they're offering out there. You can hear the cry of the millions that perish without Christ. Hear the cry of the millions that perish while we've turned Christmas into a circus. Let me tell you something, folks. It's time God talked to hearts and made you and I realize, amen, if the wicked, it is a wickedness 
of the church that refused to warn the wicked. But God said, if you don't warn the wicked, you're going to face me with the blood of that wicked on your hands. God said, if you tell him and he won't listen, that's his responsibility. But if you don't tell him, I will require the blood of that 3,000 million people at your hand. Amen. I know we can't go everywhere, but we must try. I said we must try. We must be reaching everywhere. From the man next door to the people where we shop to the uttermost ends of this earth. They're going to die. They're going to go to hell. They're never going to come back. If your husband died without God, he's in hell. And if you ever see him, it'll be in hell. I'll tell you. If you go to heaven, you won't ever see him again. If grandma died without Christ, doesn't matter she lived to be 101 and was a sweet old lady. She's in hell. My God, we've got to hear that. Because we alone are responsible. The church, I'm saying, for taking this message. We have been unfaithful, doing hundreds of good things that the Lord never told us to do, while millions perish without Christ. We have hundreds of things that we never were told to do, but we're faithful in them. Millions perish without Christ. While the gospel remains bottlenecked for a great part here in America, the world is growing more heathen at the rate of millions. Millions more being born that are being reborn. Millions more are being born that are being reborn. Out there tonight, if God could somehow tune our ear to the cry of hell this morning and the millions that are going... We all know this in theory, but we delay in actuality. God, grant us action before it's too late. We have cash for everything but Christ's cause. We, we can be terribly broke when it comes time to reach out, but terribly wealthy when it comes time. We don't believe in any kind of pledge, and many people say. But if you could see the bills piled up through these days of circus, You'd, be, you'd, you'd sure know somebody believes in pledging. We pledge to Sears. We pledge to credit cards. We pledge to every other kind. But we don't want to do any pledging to God. We don't want to be obligated in this matter. But I'm going to tell you something, church. Whether you want to be or not you are, there's a day we're going to stand before God and the millions that are lost. I believe that cry will rise up out of that darkened pit and He'll point a finger at us and say millions of them are there that wouldn't have had to be there if you'd have cared like you ought to have cared. If you'd have been burdened as you ought to have been burdened, there's a sore evil which I've seen under the sun. Namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. Ecclesiastes 5 and 13. An evil, God said, under the sun. The selfish withholding of Christ from nations is nothing less than the grossest form of cruelty. To withhold Jesus from those on this, on this Christmas Eve, I talked to a very dear friend of mine, having lived 27 years without Christ, he just finding Jesus in a t deliverance of his life. I said to him, isn't it wonderful that you're going to wake up in the morning and can remember Christmas Eve? Oh my God, I've spent a lot of them I couldn't remember. Wake up on Christmas Day wondering where in the name of heaven have I been? A hundred yards of barbed wire fence on my bumper. Amen. Wonder what went on. But let me tell you, I'm going to wake up in the morning. Thank God I'm going to remember Christmas Eve. I hope I get drunk on the Holy Ghost. But I can tell you something to know Jesus Christ. Oh, God, to know that Savior. But to know Him and to know that multiplied millions... Three billion of them have never heard about Him or to haunt us. I said it ought to haunt us in our rejoicing over being saved. There ought to be a burden over those, not that they won't be saved, but they've never heard the gospel to be saved. The logic is inexorable. The guilt is clear and piling up. God must give us sacrifice in men and women. 
You can't talk to a man that believes in Christ in the rapture that doesn't believe we've come to the end of an age. You can't talk. Even unsaved men say, Preacher, what do you think all this means? What's happening? An empire has come apart without a shot being fired except internally. What do you think is happening? What is going on? The world knows that something strange is happening. And the church has come to know and believe that we stand on the threshold of a tribulation and a rapture. And yet millions perish and we're more concerned about our own little bit of life that we have here. You know, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. I'm pretty sure I won't be here as long as I have been. If I make it to the average age, then I'm going to be around here kicking for another six or eight years. But I can tell you I won't be here as long as I have been. Time is running out. A fellow told me the other day, he said, you know, it seems like that the years go by faster. I said, it always speeds up when you start downhill. Amen. And you never look like get to 20. You're going up. But when you turn downward, it goes a lot faster. Time is of such essence. My God, they perish out there without Jesus. And the church must stand before Him one day and give an answer as to what we have done. God, give us sacrifice. And men and women who will share everything and lay aside anything that this gospel may be preached. I was reading in a doctor's manual that there's no death as horrible as hemorrhaging. They say there's absolutely, listen to me, no death as horrible as a man bleeding to death, the hemorrhage to death. It's said in this doctor's book that when that blood begins to leave, and as it goes, then everything in that body begins to fight for the life that's left. And the corpuscles and everything else turn against and said it absolutely savages that body in trying to preserve itself. Said nothing is so horrible as a death by hemorrhaging. Let me tell you, there's nothing so horrible as to die without the blood of Jesus, my God, men to perish without that blood. Then to slip into eternity without that blood. For men who have been appointed to die, but after that moment is a judgment. You know what that means? That moment God is there. When you walk through that door, God is there. And when you step through there, you're going to reckon then there's no excuse, nothing you say, you either did or you didn't. That's the way it's going to be. He said, you put yourself on that altar. And when you ask, I will give. Because if you're on that altar, your asking will be for that heathen, that man, that woman, without God. I want to tell you something, church. Whether you accept it or don't accept it, whether you do or you don't, you are responsible. Bow your head.